Well, good morning and a pleasant Sabbath and welcome to the Mount Sinai Seventh-day Adventist Church at study looking this quarter at Isaiah. Before we continue our Sabbath school lesson this morning, we will have special music by Brother Eric Teamer. you 
still feeling down And it seems your world is falling all around No need to fear created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho he froze the sun allowing victory he's toppled giants with tiny stones he's brought fire from heaven he shut the mouths of lions he preserved life in the belly of a well he's fed thousands with a few loaves he gives the weak strength he heals the sick he's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. Good morning again and welcome to 
Mount Sinai Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School. We thank Brother Timur for that beautiful rendition in music. And uh, this morning we have some special guests who will be joining us in our conversation on this week's Sabbath School lesson. Just a few house uh, housekeeping before we get into the meat of the Sabbath School discussion. Uh, the Sabbath School offerings, expense, and mission 13 Sabbath offerings, please remember those offerings to be sent in and the discovery bible school today at 3 to 5 p.m and the relevant information via zoom is available on the church bulletin let me take the opportunity of welcoming elder june james one of our elders at mount sinai seventh-day adventist church and a good friend of mine who i grew up with elder ryan sharp ryan if you could just unmute yourself please Elder Ryan Sharp, who lives upstate New York in the cold icy box, 24 degrees. So, brethren and sister, brother and sister, we have been studying Isaiah. Before we get into the Sabbath school lesson, shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness, for your mercies, and your grace. We thank you that we have this opportunity of coming into your presence to worship you. We pray that as we open your word now that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us, to teach us, and lead us into what you desire for us to learn this morning, we pray for Christ's sake. So, 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 we are... We are on the third lesson of this quarter's lesson. <laughs> this quarter, we're studying the book of Isaiah. And uh, this week, we are at chapter 7 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, talking about when your world is falling apart. And we, we, we see, as we studied this week, Elder James, that the, the, the main characters or the main character that was focused on this week in the, in the lesson is a gentleman, a king by the name of Ahaz. Elder James, would you care to give us the context of Ahaz uh, based on 2 Kings chapter 16 and also what we have come to learn of him in, in Isaiah chapter 7? Please. Good morning, Sabbath blessings. Yes, um, Ahaz was the grandson of uh, Uzziah, and he chose Ahaz is a classic case in choices have consequences. Um, Ahaz, at 20 years old, assumed reign and kingship, um, and he reigned for 16 years. He was the king of Judah. And he made choices that were out of God's will. He made decisions that he would and offer incenses. And those choices had ripple effects for Judah down through the ages. He made choices that and made alliances that were unholy alliances. And those unholy alliances, once again, had consequences for himself and for Judah. And it just reminds us that God is constantly running after us and says, you know, this is the way, choose this right way. But Ahab thought that he was wiser than God and he chose to listen to outside influences rather than listen to the voice of God as God sought to instruct him and teach him. And he did not follow after the pattern of those that came before him, but chose to follow a path that led him away from God. June, how old was Ahaz when he started reigning over in Judah? He was 20 years old and he reigned for 16 years. Okay, so you're saying to me that you, um, this 20 year old young man is being asked to take on such a responsibility as given to him by God. And he is not mature enough to handle the, the situation God is uh, has placed him in? You know, when we think of 20 years old today, mm -hmm. we think of someone who is very immature. And for some people, 
there's some there's some 20 year olds will say i beg to differ i am a very mature individual but science has shown that especially for men for males that their development is not fully accomplished until they're at least 25 at least 25 for some it has taken longer but we'll give them 25. it is also when i think of ahaz at 20 years old and king josiah at eight years old what a contrast because an eight-year-old had enough sense and had enough common sense to say you know what we have been astray from god for a long time it's bad it's, it's time for us to get back to the faith of our fathers it's time for us to get back to god so no i will not give him a pass because at 20 years old he knew he should have known better i should say and he there was an example before him of how to walk with god and how to live for god All and right. so yes um back then a 20 year old was was definitely accomplished because he would have gone through the bat the bar mitzvah and all of those rituals for for manhood so there was more training for him than there is for 20 or 20 year old today okay so let us give a so you you've given the the, the personal context in which ahaz was operating let us give some some geographic um context what was happening at the time in, in Israel's existence was that the kingdoms had divided. There, there were the, the 12, the, 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 the 10 northern tribes and the, and, and the other two to the south. You had Israel to the north, Assyria, or call it Syria, Damascus, all the way up north. And then you had Judah to the south. Judah was always in conflict. And here it was, this young man, uh, two powers, were now allying themselves to attack him. Ella Sharp, would you care to give us the, the, the context of that geographical and political uh, struggle that was going on between these two, these war factions? Well, it tells a compelling story because what we have here is the theme of the lesson, when your world falls apart, because as Sister June aptly described for us, Ahaz is a leader. Of, of a group of people and for all intents and purposes he wants to maintain uh, the kind of economy he has the the rulership etc so he learns that these two kingdoms uh syria and israel uh they have a plan to come against assyria but they need his involvement so he's dealing with peer pressure He's also dealing with the fear of the people, his own people. Um, Isaiah 7 tells us that they shook with fear as the trees of the forest shake before a strong wind. So he was dealing with all of that peer pressure and he was overwhelmed. And, and for us, um, reviewing this lesson, I think it's important for us to put ourselves in the lesson. Uh, what do we do when we are overwhelmed with fear? And, and there's trouble coming up against us. And that's where Ahaz was. He had a choice. He could, um, he could rely on God. He could align himself with uh, Syria and, and Israel. Or, and, and he's now being the rational person, he could align himself with his enemy's enemies. His enemy's enemy. And we have a saying, um, our enemy's enemy is our friend. And that's where Ahaz was. But as uh, Sister June aptly described, his relationship with God was troublesome. So while he was overwhelmed, we now see in the lesson, and it lays out for us, what happens to us when we are overwhelmed. And Ahaz had a number of options. And I think the lesson lays out for us. His choice here, the choices he made, certainly his history pointed to someone who had a troublesome relationship with God. We are told he sacrificed babies on the altar, that he burnt offerings to Baal. For all intents and purposes, up to this point, we learn that he was one of the worst kings in Judah. But like with us, God, and I don't want to get too much into it, but I guess I'll phrase it as a question. Does God show mercy to us? when we are overwhelmed or when we feel attacked. It's interesting the points you have brought out, Elder Sharp, because 
when you look at Second Kings chapter 16, we read in the last few, the, the last sentence of, of, of that verse, it says, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. Now, <laughs> we all know the, the, the history of David. And we all know the, 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 the end of David's life. But here it is that a young man would have known the genealogy and the history of his forefathers. He would have known what his grandfather, what his great grandfather David did. He would have known what his uh, grandfather Solomon did. He would have known what his father uh, Jeroboam did, right? Now, how is it that we can have all this insight into our genes and still make the mistake of sacrificing children, of doing abominable things against God, when you have had the evidence of God's leadership in your, in, in your forefathers' lives? Anyone? Mm. We, God does not have grandchildren. God has only children. So we cannot go on the faith of our fathers. Mm -hmm. We have to establish faith and a relationship with God for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to establish, I'm going to read from Isaiah 7, 9 that says, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So we have to have that connection ourselves with God in order for our faith to be cultivated and developed. So oftentimes, you know, we, we look at our parents, we look at our grandparents and say, oh, they read the Bible, they were so spiritual, they prayed three times a day or more. And we think we can go on their coattails, but no. Ahaz needed to have had established a relationship with God himself as it relates to David. Yes, we all know David's track record. But the difference for David was that he each time acknowledged his sin, acknowledged that he was weak, but yet, as in Psalms 51, he went back to God, he asked for forgiveness and reestablished that relationship, that connection with God. Yes, we'll fall. Yes, we'll have mishaps, but the key is to reconnect to God, knowing that he has never left, he is always there, and he is always reaching out for us to come back to him. Okay, good. Thank you, Elder. Now, Elder Sharp, earlier you, you, you made mention and you were going to go into the whole tragedy and the whole crisis that, 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 that A has faced. I want you to speak specifically of the, the, the decision and the choices that he made. Um, he's faced with this, this confrontation. He's faced with this battle. He's faced with making a decision. Uh, do I go to the right? Do I go to the left? Um, explain to us what transpired as he was battling with making these choices, please. The, the lesson and the reason I enjoy this lesson is it has a number of themes. And um, Sister June aptly described the, the need to connect with God and have a personal relationship. What also comes out in the lesson is God's effort to reconcile with man. Now, I would have thought with Ahaz's track record that he was surely cut off from God and had that option was off the table. But here we learn that God sends his prophet Isaiah to meet with Ahaz to not only um, affirm that he's God and he's with him, but he tells him um, in clear, clear words that the enemies you face are not as big as you think. In fact, I'm on your side. And if you trust me, you won't have anything to worry about. And that's a consistent theme throughout the Bible because we see uh, there was a point where Elisha had a servant and the servant saw what he thought were terrible enemies. And, 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 and Elisha, in trying to get him to have a better perspective, says, you know, they are more with us than against us. So throughout the Bible, we have this theme of a loving God who seeks to win men and women back to himself regardless of our track record. And Ahaz 
was certainly put in this position here with the, the fear of attack from the king of Israel and uh, Syria. God assured him, uh, you have nothing to fear. Just trust me. Um, and if, if you trust me, you will have the victory. Your people will be safe. If you don't trust me, and this is our loving God again, he gives us the power of choice. If you don't love me, I've sent Isaiah's son, and in his name is the import of what will happen if you make the wrong choice. Uh, a remnant will return, which implies captivity will, will take place. You may have a victory in the short term, but in the long run, the people of Judah are going to suffer. So Elder Sharp and Elder James, God speaks directly to Ahaz. Not only does God speak to him, but God also sends a prophet to speak to him. He got he, He's getting this message two times. Elder James, talk about that, the, 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 the message that God gave to Ahaz personally, as well as the message that, um, that Isaiah gives him. Well, as, as uh, Elder Sharp rightly stated, God says that, yes, these are these armies want you to go with them, but no, I will be with you. I want you to make the decision and understand that I am your Sabaoth. I am the one who fights with you and fights for you. I, God, when you have the victory, I can get the glory, not these individuals that you think that you can, you know, go with and have success with. You know, oftentimes we think we, what, what's the term that's used? We're smelling ourselves, thinking that we are all that. We have, you know, we have the PhD, we have the, the DD, we have all of these things. We have more degrees than a thermometer mm -hmm. and thinking, listen, I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I've been to Yale and Harvard and Oxford and all these places. And I, I can make that decision. But God, it, I'm always amazed of how patient God is with us. And he gives us, as it says, time after time, he is pleading with us. Listen, I am the creator of the universe. I spoke and it was so. I commanded and it stood fast. Listen to me. But oftentimes we think that we have a greater understanding and knowledge beyond what God does and choose to follow our own path. And so in him following his own path, even though God gave him time and time again with Isaiah to say, and it was a hint, okay, I'm bringing Isaiah's son, which means remnant, take the hint. I will bring you out. You don't have to go with these individuals, but he chose not to. But, um, you know, we like I said, co choices have consequences, and oftentimes we have to pay that consequence for the decisions we make. Excellent point, Elder James. And and I, I just want to add to what Elder James said that um, patience and faith seem to be first cousins. Mm -hmm. And I think as we we review this lesson, uh, there is something in it for us in terms of our patience and our faith. Because we could all look back at our lives, and I know I certainly can, where my impatience led to, to more pain than it had to. Um, nevertheless, a loving God does not forsake us when we are at times impatient. We should learn uh, from these lessons, though, because our decisions, and we learn from this lesson, not only impact us, but here in this case, a has his decision, which he thought in the short term was a good one, impacted uh, the children of Judah. There's a saying, today's problems are as a result of yesterday's solution. Wow, wow. Uh, let me take the opportunity of welcoming Dr. Selwyn Carrington, who is with us. Dr. Would you kindly unmute yourself so we can hear you? And uh, we're, we're, going, we're going to have you jump right into the conversation. Um, so we're, we're at the point in the lesson where we are looking at uh, the, the message that God gave Isaiah and, and, and the invitation that he also gave to, um, to Ahaz. Do you have any thoughts on that? Would you care to elaborate a bit on what, you, what, what your thoughts are as you studied this week's lesson on that? Well, <clears throat> uh, Ahaz is probably the epitome of what rebellion looks like against God. And um, when we... Uh, feel ourselves too big for our bridges, as it were, and we, we tend to believe that uh, 
we are bigger than God and smarter than God, we find ourselves ending up like Ahaz, uh, being uh, totally rebellious, uh, recalcitrant, unrepentant, and we uh, are, as we're uh, walking a road that will ultimately lead to perdition. And this is what uh, Ahaz found himself doing here in, in, in these uh, chapters. It, it, it's pretty sad that a son of David would find himself like this. But but uh, this challenge is one that we also face today because many of our children grow up, they do not want to hear about God. As I said in the, uh, in, in the book of Judges, there arose a generation that knew not God or the mighty work of God. And this is where Ahaz is leading the children of Israel. So, Amen. I, I want us to, to focus somewhat on the on, on the two sons that were that were uh, presented here in the in, in this lesson. One, we were told that Isaiah was to take his son. What was it? What was the name of Isaiah's son? Share. So a, a pretty big word, Mahar and, and and what's the meaning of the of his name? His his name that, that the first one is it means uh, swift um, judgment as it were, and uh, the name of the second son a remnant will will remain. A remnant will remain. Let us. What is the significance of that of Isaiah bringing that son to um, Ahaz, and then what is the significance of the second son that Isaiah? prophesied to Ahaz about? Well, the, the first, the, when Ahaz came to, um, when Isaiah came, came to Ahaz with, with his son, he, he wanted to let him know that uh, God is going to basically uh, destroy the northern kingdom and it's going to be a swift destruction. But at the same time, uh, with the, in the case of the second son, that uh, the, the a remnant will return, will remain. As was said early in the lesson, God is really more interested in saving His people, and He does everything to accomplish that salvation. The 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 rebellion that was noted in the northern kingdom uh, was something that uh, had started since Jeroboam uh, brought in idolatry from the days of from the days in Israel. And after that rebellion, Israel never ever got back to loving and serving God. So their uh, cup of indignation was full. And God says he was going to execute swift judgment on the northern kingdom. And then with, with, with the southern kingdom also would ultimately perish, which is the kingdom of Judah. And with the perishing of the southern kingdom, and, uh, however, because of God's promise to David, he would allow a remnant to, return, to remain. Uh, that remnant, uh, ultimately, however, uh, would prove unfaithful, and they too would go into captivity. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in, in all this uh, uh, actuality, there's also a symbolism that God always has a remnant. And even for the church of God, when it has proven rebellious, there's always a remnant that remains. Uh, the, the church of God was a pure church in the first century, and subsequently it became ultimately quite rebellious. And you know the the, the uh, forces of our churches that have um, historically that have loved money more than God and have made alliances with ungodly things rather than with godly things, and as a consequence, has caused the church of God to uh, go through some pretty ugly times. But in spite of all that, a remnant always still remains. And we are thankful to God for his mercy and his goodness in allowing a remnant to remain so that uh, his works can be carried out in this world until he comes and takes it home forever. Verse 14 of, of Isaiah chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Mm -hmm. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was now. Bible scholars are torn as to which Emmanuel this is. Whether it was a prophesying of the 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 the, 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 the promised child through the line of the lineage of David, um, Emmanuel, God with us, or it was some other Emmanuel. But based on our understanding of Scripture, Elder James. How do you understand verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 7? What is your understanding? 
Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 from the beginning, going back to the beginning when Adam and Eve made their choice and the choice they made had significant consequences for humanity. God had promised that he would have, we would have a redeemer, we would have a goel. And so Isaiah is speaking again as it would it was stated that behold a virgin it was known that it would come through the line of david and it would be a virgin so he is just reiterating what god had already promised and and that's what i love about god is that he keeps his promise he has proven himself trustworthy and so even from the beginning that they could hold on to hope knowing that a Goel, a Redeemer, a Savior, a Emmanuel was coming. So first it was, it, it aligned with the fact that it was from a virgin. It was from David's line. And it was one that was promised that would be God with us. And so here we can depend on God to keep his promises and know that he's trustworthy and know that Emmanuel is God with us. We then see this prophecy being fulfilled when we turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall, shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So 700 years later, we are seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy as, as made in Isaiah chapter 7. Amen. What does that tell us? Um, do, does that inspire any confidence in you as an individual? Does it inspire any confidence as a church that God spoke something 700 years prior to, to it happening and then <laughs> it became a reality 700 years later? Amen, amen. Dr. Carrington? Well, of, of course, this is ultimately inspiring for, for the scientists in me. You know, you can't really understand it, but you, you are happy that God is faithful to his promises, even though it may take 700 years. What a God, you know? So it, it makes me excited to know that I serve a God who is faithful uh, to, to his promises. And notice that this promise uh, indicates that God would send someone to redeem me. Emmanuel coming is God with us. And why is God coming to be with us? Because he wants us to save his people from their sin. As, as in, Matthew, in Matthew that you said. So what a wonderful God. How, how meaningful it is to me. And the mere fact that he has come to save me makes me believe that he is coming back to take me to glory when that day comes. I can Amen. believe his promises this morning. Amen. Amen. I, I, I can see you getting all excited now. <laughs> just before we um just to, to, to intersperse here because we see where god spoke to ahaz directly and as we said earlier the, the prophet isaiah came and spoke to him and here it was that a man is refusing a sign that god has offered to give him we saw in previous in, in previous biblical experience where God says, hey, what do you want? And Solomon says, hey, you're asking me what I want? This is what I want. Give me wisdom. Here it is that God is saying to Ahaz, what do you want? I will give you a sign. Just tell me what sign you want. Just to know that I am with you. I am going to protect you. And what was his response? He don't want it. <laughs> Brother Marcel. <laughs> Brother Marcel. Yes. I, you know, while we're beating up on Ahaz, let's bring it home to us. I, you, you're, you're stepping one step ahead of me, June, but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> How many times, even this past week, we yeah. don't have to look at 10 years ago. How many times has God said to us, prove me? God said to you, do this. And we were not obedient. He said, delayed obedience is disobedience. Mm -hmm. So these things are written for our examples. 
when we read this, we shouldn't be beating up on Ahaz saying he rebelled. We should be looking at ourselves and say, Father, Holy Spirit, reveal to me how am I rebelling against your direct, your direct word, your direct missive, your direct direction to say, June, this is what I need for you to do. And so, yes, it's good that we can read this as a story, but the importance is how do our lives align with God's word and what he says, this is the way walk in it. Because in, I, in, in Psalms 32, 6, um, Psalms 32, 8 rather, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will guide you with mine eye. We must take God at his word each and every day, every aspect of our lives. And June, you know, they have a saying in Jamaica, um, when you throw a stone in, in, a, in, in a hog's pen, the first one that squeals out is the, is the one that it hit. And I'm going to be the first to confess and admit that I have been a hair, Ahaz. Um, mm. I have repeatedly um, heard God's word and repeatedly said, hey, um, you know, I think I know a little better than you. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I am I'm going to make this choice. Mm. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, I will confess that it is certainly not an easy thing to say we mm -hmm. hear God's voice and we're going to follow it. Mm -hmm. And we read it as his experience. And as you said, we, we, we come down on him like a ton of bricks. How could God speak to you and you don't listen? How could a prophet speak to you and you don't listen? And um, um, many times God has spoken to me and many times he has spoken to me through friends or a relative or someone else, and I have decided that, hey, you know, I think I am a bit smarter <laughs> than what you guys are saying. Yes, Elder Sharp. And the, the, the great thing about God is he doesn't just leave this story in the Bible. We have other examples of kings who faced with similar challenges. Uh, Jehoshaphat, I believe, relied on God, had a worship service, and the two competing arm the armies that were attacking his kingdom, attacked each other. We have other examples of individuals who, who, who indicated that the prophet knows what we are saying when we're saying it in secret. We have examples of how God can come through when we allow him to, as he did here, he gives us a blank check and he says, tell me what you want. Wow. Luckily, wow. we have examples of what happens positively when we obey God. So as, as Elder June indicated, Ahaz is all of us. We are Ahaz. And God is in essence, even with this lesson, saying, listen, my, my goal is to reconcile with you. Regardless of your checkered past, I am seeking reconciliation. And Amen. you will have a great future if you obey and trust me. Amen. Amen. Um, no, no, Dr. Selwyn? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you were going to make a comment on that. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I, I think um, it was, it's pretty well said. I, I, I think that we should do both. I think we should condemn Ahaz and we should condemn ourselves. Bad behavior to be condemned because it will encourage it may encourage us into somebody else. But but we <laughs> definitely need to to, to do both. <laughs> You know, um, I, I'm reminded of two texts as we we we, we focus now on the uh, in the last part of the of, of our conversation on Emmanuel, God with us. We were told in John chapter one that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation of Christ was manifested in that He became a living human being and experienced all the things that we have experienced. Um, in, in, in first John, first John chapter one, verses one through three, it says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and the father and was manifested in, in us that which we have seen and have heard we declare unto you that you 
also may, be, may, may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. All these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Amen. This morning, this morning, we can have the assurance of our joy being full because Emmanuel, God with us, came, dwelt among us, lived with us, and I'm going to leave the other exciting part of what he is doing and what he will do for us. Sister June, you want to tell us more about that? Well, um, I am looking forward to not only the fact that he is here with us, but someday soon we can see reunite with him again face to face. Um, I, I think of the song that says, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Someday the silver cord will break. And, you know, that is the excitement. You know, I, I, I was smiling as Dr. Carrington was so elated of knowing that, you know, Emmanuel, God with us. But just to know, just to, to, to be reminded that someday soon, that this, someday soon these trials will be over. And, and you know, this is just the beginning. Yes. We're thinking this, what we're going through right now is, is you know, squeezing us. But... We ain't feel squeezed yet, um, but <laughs> but I'm looking beyond. I'm looking beyond what is surface right now, and knowing that as God promised that He was going to send Emmanuel, that and He and I know He keeps His promises. That I know I can trust Him to come back again. He's coming back again, and that is what my vision, my view, is focused on. And, but even while I'm looking at him to come back, I am reminded that he says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. And okay. that is the promise of Emmanuel. We have just two minutes to wrap up. Dr. Carrington and, and Elder Sharp, I'm going to ask you guys, encourage us as a Sabbath school class. Encourage us as a church. What are your thoughts? What What do you want to leave the Sabbath school class with this morning as a word of encouragement to take us through the, 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 this coming week? Elder Carrington first. Okay, I, I would definitely say, um, believe in the Lord thy God, so shall you prosper. Believe in his prophet, so shall you be established. And uh, Ahaz uh, refused to do either of those things and suffered severe consequences. And uh, my encouragement to everybody is to believe God and believe his prophets. Amen. Ella Sharp? Ahaz was overwhelmed and he was fearful. And we all experience those emotions at various times. Uh, God is in a sense saying, I'm with you. Even when it doesn't seem like it, the assurance as we read um, uh, Isaiah 7, is that that promise is still ours god is with us even during our trials and um as as elder june and elder carrington and you yourself marcel had reminded us we can beat up on ourselves we can beat up on ahaz but we have the assurance that god is with us and he wants to reconcile with us and that should give us hope and encouragement as well yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you, Emmanuel, is with me. Amen. You, Emmanuel, your rod and your staff, Emmanuel, they comfort me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And unlike Ahaz this morning and unlike Marcel earlier, I want to take those promises that God has given to us and I want to hold them dear to my heart. I want to not only hold them dear to my heart, I want to live them out as I sojourn for the rest of my life. As we've all said this morning, may we just may we not just use the experience of Ahaz as an intellectual understanding of who God is, but as an experiential experience of knowing who God is, knowing that God is with us, and we can rest assured on that fact. Let us more heads. And Elder Sharp, may I invite you to pray for us to close, please? 
Father, we thank you for the review of this lesson. We thank you for these timely messages and these themes that connect so much with our experience. We, we saw through the pages a loving God, a merciful God who is seeking to build and improve the relationships with his people who are challenged on every side. We are all over the pages of this book, of this lesson, and we thank you for the encouragement and the assurance that you are with us and that you will never leave us or forsake us. Increase our faith, increase our relationship with you, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the Sabbath, friends, and God bless you. God bless you. Okay. Thank you. These dogs and their owners are thrilled that these one-year in-mission volunteers have become a part of their community. The young volunteers came to Ecuador's capital city, Quito, to share the love of Jesus. And surprisingly, this includes taking care of dogs. The story begins when a global mission pioneer couple, Christian and Maribel, moved into this community and found no Adventists living here. We wanted to reach a group of professional people who, for various reasons, have not included the church in their hearts and lives. In this upper middle class neighborhood, people seem to have everything they need, like nice houses and cars. The challenges in this place are that people don't open their hearts easily. First, we wanted them to open the doors to their homes. Christian and Maribel started by finding out what the people truly needed. Since this was a large community, they recruited a team of one-year in-mission volunteers to help them. Here's what the team discovered. Community members really needed help taking care of their pet dogs. There were quite a few people who wanted their dogs to be walked, and the one-year in-mission team helped with this. They helped by walking the dogs, caring for them, and they even held a health fair for pets. By taking care of the dogs, the team got to know the owners. Our objective is to reach people with a relationship by making friends, visiting them, and going to the park with them. Because of these new friendships, community members started scheduling Bible studies when planning walks for their dogs. Over time, several people gave their hearts to Jesus. I feel happy when someone accepts Jesus. It's gratifying to know that they know and believe in a God of hope and love. Now, because of walking dogs and building relationships, a new congregation of believers meets each Sabbath and is still growing. Please pray for this group as they share the love of Jesus in this large city. Pray for global mission pioneers like Christian and Maribel, as well as the one year in mission team. God is using them to change lives here in Ecuador.